It's been a good week for freedom on the whole, mostly because of a bunch of normal working class blokes who just happened to drive 40 ton trucks. Judging by social media, the convoy has really put a spring in the step of those who would rather dangerous freedom over comfortable slavery. Listening to Morgoth's review, for example, it was a delight of a different kind than one normally gets from hearing his peerless commentary. He actually sounded happy, and that's really something. And it is a delight to know that somebody, anybody, anywhere is fighting back, and fighting back effectively, more to the point. As is often the case when listening to Morgoth, I found myself nodding in agreement but this time it was for a different reason. Or rather, it was the tone that was different. It wasn't just the stubborn defiance in the face of overwhelming odds, which is usually the flavour of his output, but it was a feeling that victory over our overlords was possible. That it wasn't inevitable, that it would be they who would prevail. Because there has often been a touch of the siege mentality on our side of the aisle, an attitude that we were right, and that we would continue to be right, even though it looked as if we could, would eventually be overrun. Our consolation would be, would be that we would, metaphorically at least, go down fighting. But the truckers' convoy, and the establishment's response, in the person of the privileged pretty boy virtue signaller, Justine Trudeau, has changed all that. Mass non-compliance has been encouraged by all the anti-lockdowners, including yours truly, for the past 22 months, as a surefire way of stymieing their plans. But it was always a theoretical tactic. It had been something that would have worked had everyone agreed to do it. But never enough people did agree, or at least there was never enough of a commitment from ordinary people to defy the authorities. Mostly and most shamefully because they wanted to be able to go on holiday rather than because they were defending the sovereignty of their very own flesh and blood. With attitudes like that, the authorities were always going to be able to pick, pick people off one by one. But as with all crises in history, people were slow to wake up. A determined and fanatical policy of psychological warfare that was unleashed upon an unsuspected and naive population didn't help. Just enough fear was applied at just the right points and everybody fell in line, or almost everybody did. There was always a hardcore of refuseniks, as there always is, but in my darkest moments I did wonder whether I was part of a loud but shrinking minority. I think that the sacking of the care home workers did alert a small but significant portion of the population that it wouldn't stop with them. They were sold down the river, and some correctly saw that the healthcare workers were next. That, I think, strengthened the resolve of enough to argue, not just about the absurdity of the regulations, but more importantly, about the ethics of it. And so the resistance stiffened, which I don't think they were expecting. They were betting on narrow self-interest to carry the day. But even narrow self-interest usually extends to one's children, and probably a small residue of doubt began to crystallise in the minds of people who were, at the very least, distinctly queasy about having their children inherit a society that can only be accessed after certain medical requirements were met. The booster shops, I think, woke a good few more up. They said we'd be free after two shots. Now they want a third. How long before a fourth? or a fifth, or a twenty-fifth. How long will this go on? But it's all been a very slow burn, too slow for my liking. But in Canada, a country that prides itself on not being America, someone in Vancouver had the brilliant idea of a truck convoy all the way to the court of Trudeau, 2,700 miles away. Even one single Mac or Peterbilt can't easily be stopped when there's thousands of them, there's no chance. And because of the vast distances involved and the open topography, particularly of the Canadian prairie provinces, it lent itself to the image of a steadily building tidal wave that could be seen coming for miles. 
something that is unlikely to be achieved in a country like mine, for instance. It was epic in its scale and seemed to have the effect of something wicked this way comes, like gathering storm clouds on the reaction of black-faced Justine, who promptly announced he was self-isolating and ran away to an undisclosed location. But as Morgoth points out, the behaviour of Trudeau and much of the Canadian establishment is telling, particularly in Justine's case. Now, as a Brit, I don't know much about Trudeau, and I'm not inclined to read Wikipedia's probably fawning account of him. But I do know that he's the son, or is he, of Pierre Trudeau, often considered one of Canada's best Prime Ministers. But I'm sure we all know that the reason he is now Prime Minister has everything to do with his name, and perhaps, to a lesser extent, his looks. But also to his cringing, virtue signalling at every possible opportunity discourse. Witness the time he needlessly corrected a supporter about her use of the word mankind. We like to say person kind, he said. That was a past the sick bag moment, if ever there was one. But as vomit is inducing as that exchange was, it's far from the worst thing he's ever said. His predictable demonisation of the convoy is hateful, far right, and with unacceptable views. He's just the latest. But the impression is that Trudeau has no bloody idea what to do when something doesn't go his way. Being the spoilt and undeniably privileged son of a fated Prime Minister has probably much to do with that. Instead of grasping the nettle, staying put and agreeing to meet with the truckers to discuss their grievances, which would have earned him at least a grudging respect, he chose to hide behind his police and secret service protection detail and disappeared, only to reappear emerging from the safety of a comfortable looking log cabin in order to denigrate the truckers even more, and that he wouldn't be intimidated. Having used coercion and bullying tactics of the most unfair kind, in forcing people to choose between their livelihoods and having a potentially life-altering or even life-destroying substance injected into their bodies, my irony meter, which has had to be rebuilt and recalibrated with a logarithmic scale numerous times over the last two years, once, a w once again went deep into the red line. A convoy supporting Twitter user recently said that the government of Canada had no idea of what good faith was in relation to the debate. I would go one further and suggest that the Government of Canada, as is the case with practically all Western governments, has no idea what good actually is. Canada's cabal, along with New Zealand's, appears from the outside to be one of the most woke in the world and is consequently marinated in the everything is racist and if you don't agree that proves you're racist too worldview that is turning so much of us off. These people only know, or think they know, what sounds good, rather than what is good. And they've never needed to know, since the great majority of them have never done anything other than politics their entire lives. And even those that have, have mostly done the kind of jobs that are basically feeder schools for the political machine, like law. Law that has become less and less like To Kill a Mockingbird, and more and more like Michael Clayton. Considering the potential of the career in law has to do good, this is somewhat surprising, but there it is. Apart from the young interns who write their speeches, who have material from their recently completed humanities degrees to draw upon, and who make the politicians sound as good as they do, there is precious little in the politician's life to incentivise them to do good. They only need to do what is effective. If they can look good while doing so, all the better, but that is a secondary consideration. Actual good doesn't enter into it. And so when they are actually confronted with good people, with good motives, they don't have a fucking clue what to do with them. For most of them, they've scarcely encountered anybody like that, certainly in their professional lives. They certainly are incapable of beating them in an argument, Hence all the censorship and the deplatforming and the threat to their livelihoods in the case of doctors who speak against the narrative. And this is their weakness, because people who just want to live their lives free from the interference of others 
aren't accustomed to being bored, so it never really enters their head that powerful people have anything to offer them in the form of inducements or bribes. This is not to say that this, if the Canadian government offered the chief organiser, whoever that might be, say $10 million to go away and sell out his comrades, it's possible they might cave. But for people of principle, the inducement of $10 million in exchange for the certainty that their brothers in arms will know what they've done, that still won't seem like a deal worth having. Honour is expensive, priceless even. And for those for whom backroom deals out of sight of the public is the norm, they just won't understand why someone wouldn't take that deal. I genuinely think they just cannot comprehend that. When I told a friend of mine that Mrs X was looking at losing her job at the NHS because she refuses to take the vaccine, his reply was indicative of those who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Principles are all very well, he said, but it's not worth losing your, sh your job over it. And that's it, uh, that's it in a nutshell, because it absolutely is worth losing one's job over it. And that's precisely why they have backed off from enforcing it with only three days to go to the deadline. They bluffed and she called. To say that I'm immensely proud of her is somewhat of an understatement. They haven't ruled it out and it is to be, to be subject to a consultation. But they blinked first. And they will blink first if we stick to our guns. That's true of bribes and it is even more true of threats. First they think they can buy us off if it is cheaper to do so, and then they think they can threaten us into compliance. But we're not like them, are we? And that is something that Canadian truckers need to remember as they attempt to turn the screws on them. When we had a fuel protest all the way back in 2000, over the amount of duty being put on fuel that was bankrupting British lorry drivers. The protest was the most gentle and the most British of protests. There was almost no violence and there was endless patience by the public who were generally sympathetic to the driver's plight. After only three short days as it began to bite into the supply chains, our Prime Minister, the ghoulish Tony Blair, resorted to claims of babies dying in incubators. This was patently untrue, since anybody or any vehicle that had even the most tenuous link with health care was allowed to pass through the barriers and fill up with fuel. Every nurse, every doctor, every paramedic and every ambulance's passport was made. But it shows that even after only three days, the pampered managerial class begin to panic. The truckers have been in Ottawa six days at the time of writing, and this very same panic is evident in the behaviour of the Canadian establishment. First with Trudeau, who probably blacked up as a disguise to enable his flight from the field of battle. And then with the most shocking spectacle of GoFundMe, who have frozen the $10 million raised that was meant to keep the truckers fed, watered and fuelled up to enable them to continue their blockade. Their press release states that they have been shown evidence of criminality and violence by the RCMP, which is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for those outside Canada who are unaware. So I'm sure that's cast iron proof then. The police, pressured by the government, have in turn pressured a private company to seize the assets of a legitimate protest group. That's real desperation. They know that they can't get the truckers to move on with force. There's just too many of them. So they go after their cash. To add insult to injury, they have even threatened to dis distribute any monies not reclaimed by the 19th, I think. You should check, but claim your refund immediately. They have threatened to distribute any monies not reclaimed by then to legitimate charities of their choosing. So your money, perhaps donated by your kids who raided their piggy banks, may very well go to Black Lives Matter to enable the organisers to increase their real estate portfolios. But as one commentator has observed, GoFundMe has just demolished its, its own business model. Who's going to trust them now? And as yet another has said, 
they have inadvertently refuelled the convoy. The threats aren't working, just like the fourth round of boosters in Israel, which are also not working. They're still going for a fifth desperation all round. In a heartwarming example of solidarity with the truckers, which also shows a shrewdness in knowing which side your bread is buttered, a truck towing company refused a request by the RCMP to tow protesters' trucks from the USA border in faraway Alberta, stating, We at Inter-Pacific Transportation Group of Companies agree with peaceful protesting and stand with our lawful friends throughout the industry who are fighting for their Canadian rights and freedoms throughout Alberta and the rest of Canada. What they didn't say, but nevertheless heavily implied, was that it would absolutely not be in their best interest to go against the concerns of their core market. Checkmates at the truckers, methinks. Now it is easy to get carried away in the moment. We have to remember that the establishment still holds nearly all the cards here. They are in all the positions of power. But what we should also remember is that that power is, in the end, illusory. The Canadian state, with all its supposed power and with all the tools at its disposal, is unable to prevent what is happening. Demonising the protesters, which is little more than name-calling, must be like water off a duck's back to a Canadian trucker. Why would he give a shit what Justin Trudeau thinks of him? Since that has failed, which it demonstrably has, they steal their money. That's just as unlikely to work either. The trucks, thousands of them, are already there, some of them with their wheels removed, and also, I imagine, many of them having deliberately exhausted their air tanks. Large trucks' brakes fail safe in that once the air supply to the brakes is insufficient, the brakes come on automatically. Now, I'm sure that there's a way to override that in the event of a breakdown, but it must require the cooperation of the operator. So good luck removing an 18-wheel Peterbilt with the brakes on in the company of an obstructive and truculent driver. So this convoy has allowed us to at least dare to hope that we could win this. And I say that as a pessimist. And although I am a pessimist, there is something in me that has refused to believe that they will win. I can't say what it is but I have always had a faith that we will emerge back into the sunlight with our freedoms restored and that those who try to take our freedoms will be cowed and ashamed of their actions. I think it may just be something as simple as not actually wanting to contemplate what a life that Klaus Schwab appears to want us to have. Maybe it's just that, but it has kept me afloat for these past 22 months. But as well as conceding that this is far from over, since they may very well have something else dastardly up their sleeve, we must fear not those that like to believe themselves the elites, because most of them, like Trudeau, are morons. Morons with no principles to anchor them, leaving them with nothing but bribes and threats to get what they want. They are morally adrift, and that makes them easy to outmanoeuvre faced with principle, unity and determination. They are impotent. The Canadian truckers have done more in a week than all the rest of us, refuse nicks, protesters, demonstrators, article and essay writers, YouTubers and, and Twitter warriors for all our genuine efforts have achieved in almost two years. This is our best chance to succeed. What they have done is obvious. But that which is not obvious is almost as important. We're told that the majority of truckers have been vaccinated. Perhaps that's true, but it seems not to have made one iota of difference to the convoy. Are we to assume, as Trudeau implies, that the truckers are a fringe minority? Are we to assume, if that is the case, that it has only been the unvaccinated truckers who have travelled to Ottawa? If this is true, or if it isn't, it still plays into our hands. If it is true, that it is only the fringe minority in the convoy, then we must conclude that it required only a fringe minority to bring Canada 
a country of 35 million people to a standstill. Having established that, just imagine how big the convoy would have been if it had included all the vaccinated truckers. What is more likely, considering the size of the convoy, is that it was both vaccinated and unvaccinated truckers that were involved. That being true, we must conclude that, at the very least, that tens of thousands of truckers who have been vaccinated have come out in support of their unvaccinated fellow truckers. Why would they do that? Is probably the question that Trudeau and his ilk are asking themselves. Why would they stand up for others when there was no concrete incentive to do so? After all, they weren't at threat of losing their jobs. We weren't threatening them. Once again, this is something that they just do not understand. Principle. Once again, this is their weakness. And there's something else still. Many, perhaps most of those truckers that got vaccinated, probably did so without really thinking about it. Many of them probably vaguely thought it was a good idea and that in some equally vague way, they were doing something good. Like most busy people, most of them probably didn't think through the ethical issues, since they were not encouraged to. But it was only once the refuseniks began to push back on guessing, did those vaccinated truckers begin to think, hold on a minute, why should we be forced to take a vaccine? Like I say, probably most of them didn't think they were being forced when they got theirs. But it would only have been afterwards that they realised that others were being forced, or at least coerced, into taking the jab. And for some reason, some glorious reason, they took on the objection of their fellow unvaccinated drivers. Perhaps some of them maybe thought that they had been duped, that they had rashly complied without really thinking deeply enough and wanted to right that wrong, if not for themselves, then for their their fellow man, their comrade? I'm just guessing. I don't know the reason. But what does appear to have happened is that there has been an awakening about the morality of forced or coerced vaccination. An awakening that really should have happened in the cloistered worlds of the so-called intelligentsia and academia, a place where people are actually paid to think. But somehow it didn't. Instead, in the similarly closed world of long-distance hauliers, a principle of bodily sovereignty, a principle that I and many others like myself have been screaming about for over a year and a half, somehow took root in the minds of independent men who had the means to do something about it. Has there ever been a clearer example of why a society needs truck drivers more, much more, than it needs intellectuals? And now it's spreading. Australian truckers are on the move again after their blockade fizzled out late last year. Or did it? Who knows what information gets through in the People's Communist Republic of Australia. In Norway, Holland, Italy and the UK there are rumours of something similar, not to mention the United States. The Canadian truckers have awakened the world to the re-emergence of principle. That principle set out in black and white in the Nuremberg Code, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights has been elevated back to where it should be. By these blokes. Aren't they magnificent? Aren't they just fucking magnificent? <laughs>